know we build this as an MTSS Leadership Institute, and we will. We will talk about MTSS and leadership. But um, I have to tell you, for us personally, it's feeling a little bit more like a Field of Dreams conference today. If you build it, they will come, and they will apparently come in droves. Um, we really thought this would be a small pilot, and then the turnout has just been overwhelming, which says that we're on to something here. We all are, this is a piece of work that we are all looking to improve, learn more about, and really create a culture of learning amongst all of our schools and districts and the state to help build better multi-tiered systems of support. Um, you know, I thought that Field of Dreams was about baseball, but apparently it was an analogy for MTSS all along. Who knew? And I'm going to try to give you that Kevin Costner look as often as I can, like during the day, so you can just catch me on that. Um, so before we start, I want to just give you a little bit of background on the genesis of this institute. And really, it started with a singular conversation that we had with a district leader we really, really respect. Um, I won't say her name because I don't want to embarrass her. Um, but she's someone who is extremely skilled, extremely knowledgeable, has worked in a variety of contexts. And she said to us, you know, I really believe in MTSS. I appreciate it. I get it. But I feel like I could use more professional development and support to actually lead the work, both from an adaptive and a technical standpoint. And so if someone like this was asking us for, for more support in that way, we thought, hmm, there are probably other people that are hungry for some similar types of professional development. So from that very singular conversation, we started to reach out to some of the networks that we're connected to and ask them, you know, is this something that you'd be interested in? And overwhelmingly, people said, yes, absolutely, please develop something. But then we thought, well, maybe this is just our inner circle of people that we're connected to. Like, is there a broader interest in this across the Commonwealth? So we put out a survey through the Commissioner's Weekly Update. Some of you may have filled it out. And immediately, 250 people responded, indicating that they had high level of interest and indicating all the types of things that they were looking for in terms of support. So based on that, we decided, oh, okay, apparently there's a demand and we should really try to develop something. And this was just, you know, a May, June. So we decided, okay, you know, we'll pilot a leadership institute and we'll require executive level teams and we'll have two days in September to pull that together. And probably not that many districts are gonna have that interest to have that type of level of teaming at two days in September when things are so busy. Um, so we put up the registration for like two weeks and in that short period of time we had 65 districts, over 550 people sign up to attend. We had to just shut down the registration because we didn't know where we were going to fit everybody. I mean you can see this is like a very, very big call. Um, we're really lucky to find it because clearly there was such a huge demand out there. We also have folks on a waiting list, so all of these sessions today are going to be recorded so that you can bring them back to your districts and that you can also share them with folks that we might be able to accommodate. But we really, you know, we wanted to be able to accommodate as many leadership teams as we could because we know that leadership is so pivotal in this work. This is not a rocket science statement. I think we all know this and there's tons of research that backs this up. Um, just as sort of one illustrative data point, Hall and Horde did some research in 2011 and found that there was a 0.74 correlation between the adaptive leadership style of administration and implementation success. It's huge, huge. So we, so we really wanted to make sure that these two days not only cover what people are leading, but how they are leading that. But before we get any further, Let's just talk about the what for just one minute, because you know, if you go to a conference, it's good if everybody's on the same page about what we're going to talk about. Um, so, in just a moment, I'm going to put a picture on the screen, okay? And then I'm going to count to three, and then I'm going to ask that everybody in the room just shout out whatever you see on the screen, okay? Now, it gets very embarrassing for me if I stand up here and nobody shouts anything out. So, I really appreciate it. I'm, maybe that's a fun game, like embarrass the state bureaucrat, I don't know. But we really appreciate it. I'm going to put up the picture, and then I'm going to count to three so that you don't embarrass yourself by yelling out early. And then you're going to shout out what it is. You ready? Okay. One, two, three. Okay. I heard like at least 
seven different things there. I thought we were all looking at the same picture. Um, I heard sub, we hear hoagie, we hear sandwich. Sometimes we just hear foot long. Um, if you're in East Boston, apparently say spooky or spooky. Somebody correct me on that one. Po' boy, if you're in Philadelphia. There's so many different names. We're all looking at the same thing. I think we all know that we're talking about the same thing. And yet, so many different words were used. But when we break it down, how did we know that we were looking at this one particular item, regardless of what you called it? So there was some type of filling, right? Could have been meat, it could have been a vegetable, it could have been a vegetable pretending to be a meat, but there's something going on inside the middle. There is the option for condiments, no pressure. You can always have those on the side. It's encased in something. Once upon a time that might have been bread, but now it's probably like a lettuce wrap or something gluten or carb free. And then ultimately, do we do that? Do we shove it in our mouth? If we do know those four things, even though we use different terms, we know that we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> so make this analogy because it, there's a lot of parallels with MTSS, right? People use, sometimes use the word MTSS, sometimes they say RTI, sometimes they say we have a whole student approach, sometimes they just say this is school, this is just how we do school, right? But there are certain key ingredients. So what are those key ingredients in our multi-tiered sub-sandwich? If you're new to this, that's what MTSS stands for, is multi-tiered sub-sandwich, by the way. <laughs> um, so, number one, right? There, we know that there is an underlying belief, core belief, for everybody in the system that all students are capable of learning, and learning at high levels and succeeding if they have the right supports. There's also the philosophy of having MTSS be rooted in proactivity and prevention, rather than responding to challenges just when they arise, looking in advance and using data in advance to figure out what kids are going to need. To do that, we're going to use evidence-based practices and strategies, whether that's high-quality curriculum materials at Tier 1, whether those are the types of interventions we're using at Tier 2 and 3, we're really going to make sure that they're evidence-based. The decisions around what to do is going to be informed by data, whether that's student-level data, classroom, school, or district-level data. The degree of support is going to be dictated by that student's need with gradated levels of intensity. And we also know that we're not just going to do this to people. This is not a system that we just lay upon people, but we really have to make sure that all stakeholders, including students and families in the community, are engaged in the process. And that it's not just going to happen in pockets of good practice, but we're going to have it systematically happen school and district wide. So those are sort of the key ingredients to our MTSS sandwich, regardless of what you call it. But now let me ask you something. Um, is this still a sub? No? Yeah. Okay. Unless you're like the most boring sandwich eater ever, that is not actually a sub, right? And draw this a parallel because sometimes we use different words for the same thing. But sometimes we use the same word and we're actually talking about different things. And oftentimes what we find with MTSS is that people go straight to the tiered interventions, which kind of makes sense given the name. In fact, you know, honestly, I, I really wish that MTSS wasn't called multi-tiered systems of support because it kind of sends you into that language about just thinking about the tiered interventions. When really, um, like, I don't know, if I, if I could rename it, I'd probably call it like school school will probably work, you know, but that name was taken. So we're going with MTSS, and it's a national term, but um, we just want to make sure that when we're using this language, and as we'll talk about it today, that we're not just talking about tiered interventions, but we're talking about all the systems and supports and the underlying beliefs. Um, also, you know, sometimes this happens, right? This is a, technically a sub as well, but sometimes we're talking about something entirely different. And then, um, finally, the eternal question, is this a sub sandwich? This is a real question. Everybody else, yell it out. Is this a sandwich? That's what I said, too. This just came up in a conversation with our new associate commissioner, Dan Anderson, who we will meet. And he asked me, is a hot dog a sub sandwich? And I was like, uh, no. Which is a really good way to talk to your new boss, by the way. I'm like, uh, no. And then he very politely pointed out to me that it actually met all of the criteria that I had just articulated. Right? Because there's the filling, there's the condiments, there's the bread, there's the mmm. So technically, it is a sub sandwich, which just 
goes to show me two things. One is that I'm kind of dense. And secondly, that even in this work, even when we're talking about how it can look different, sometimes we have visions of what something is supposed to look like so embedded in our brains that it's hard to imagine and contextualize in a different context. So we just put that out there too. Some, this work looks different in different places, and that's okay, but as long as we're talking about those same ingredients, it's really what matters. Okay, so have folks seen this graphic before? Raise your hand if you've seen it. Okay, probably at least like two thirds of the room. Um, this was the original Massachusetts Tiered System of Support blueprint that was created around 2011. And it really set an important foundation for this work in the state. But um, as we all know, education basically runs in dog years. So, you know, eight years ago is like, like 56 years ago at this point, right? And so there's a lot that has changed. And so we made, decided um, in 2018 that we needed to make an update. And in particular, we wanted to update the framework to reflect the most recent research and reflect the fact that it's uh, depicted in ESSA. We wanted to improve the usability because sometimes like the way information is presented is just as important as the content of that information. And so we brought on a visual designer to help really um, create a visual that would be much more communicable um, than what we were able to do in the past. And then finally, we had heard from people that knew about MTSS and believed in it, but they really needed more support in terms of implementation. So we've been working on developing out all types of tools and resources, which we'll tell you more about later this morning, to help give artifacts, examples, protocols to actually support the work on the ground. So this is the new blueprint, ta-da! Uh, and this is gonna be the center point of our conversations over the next two days. Um, any questions? Nobody else wants to ask a question in this size group, but um, if you do, there are um, DESE staff and some of our partners all over um, Foxborough Regency today, so if you have any challenges at any point, please come and find somebody. We wanna make sure that this experience is um, beneficial and effective for everyone as possible. And um, without any further ado, um, in the spirit of Field of Dreams, um, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Kevin Costner. What? <laughs> Kevin Costner is totally not here. But this person is way better and was not involved with Waterworld, so trust me, this is gonna be much better. I am really thrilled that Dr. Urban Scott is here with us from Harvard Graduate School's School of Education, Harvard Graduate School of Education, where he specializes in educational leadership as well as the intersectionality of faith and educational communities. Prior to coming to Harvard, Dr. Scott served as the Deputy Director for K-12 Education at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There he led the investment of over $300 million in initiatives. Any that left? Okay, all right, never mind. Uh, focused on transforming how teachers are recruited, developed, and rewarded. Uh, he spent over 20 years of his career as an English teacher, principal, choral director, assistant superintendent, and the chief academic officer of Boston Public Schools. Among so many other accomplishments, many of which you can read in your packets, Dr. Scott has supported the development of leaders in a host of different settings, including Harvard's Urban School Leaders Summer Institute, Prince George's County Public School District, and in just a moment, the MTSS Leadership Institute. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Urban Scott. Good morning, everyone. Let's try that again with a little more life. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, turn to your neighbor real quick, make sure that they're awake, give them a high five, give them a high five. Give somebody in this room a high five. Everybody give somebody a high five. I am delighted to be here. Thank you so much for that introduction, um, Rebecca. Um, and I am excited about this opportunity to just talk to you a few, a few minutes uh, around this topic that I'm calling Leading for Student Success in three movements. Um, but first of all, let me just thank you for having me. I have been a teacher, a principal, a district leader, um, spent some time at the Gates Foundation. Um, and um, it is such an honor 
to speak to educators who are doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis now. Um, my colleague and friend Fred Hess, uh, Frederick Hess, wrote a book called um, Letters to Education Reformers. And in the book there's a chapter that, the title of the chapter is Doers and Talkers. Doers and Talkers. And basically his thesis is that there are people who do the work in education and there are people who talk about the work in education. And I want to acknowledge that you are doers. You do it on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to acknowledge that right now I am more of a talker as a university uh, professor. I talk and I train individuals to ultimately be leaders, but you on a day-to-day -day basis are doers, and I just want to acknowledge that. I celebrate the work that you do, and it's an honor uh, for me to be here. Uh, show of hands real quick, how many people have a Twitter account, Tell the Truth? Raise your hand. Awesome, awesome, awesome. How many people don't have a Twitter account? Oh, oh my goodness, that's a lot of people. How many people never want to have, just kidding, uh, Twitter account? If you, if you have a Twitter account, uh, and I'm serious about this, um, go on Twitter, you can do it even now, and um, follow me at at iScott4, and let's continue the conversation that we're going to have today. It's one of the things, I find Twitter to be a pretty powerful tool um, for education, for educators, and so I use it um, to continue conversations that I can't necessarily have with you with 500 people now. We can have it on Twitter, and so let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Twitter at iScott4. Philip Schlechty, Philip Schlechty uh, is a scholar and educator and does a lot of thinking about education. And he said this quote, uh, if you do not have time to read, you do not have time to lead. I love that quote. If you do not have time to read, you do not have time to lead. And since this conversation is about leadership, ultimately of MTSS, yes, but ultimately about leadership writ large, then I thought, and it's something I do oftentimes in my presentations, um, I thought I would share with you some of the things that I am reading or things that I have read that have had an impact on my leadership. We're ultimately leaders. And um, my father used to have, my father has an ex a saying that experience is the best teacher, but it's not the only teacher. And I find that for leaders, reading is powerfully important to do for doing great leadership. So let me show you real quick just some of the things that I'm reading, and then I'll jump into my presentation. Um, the first one, or things that I've read. This, school, this book right here, Trust in Schools, if you've heard of this book, raise your hand real quick. Oh my goodness, you've got to get this book if you are a leader. Trust in Schools by Anthony Bright is about building relationships and building trust with those who follow you in order to lead effectively. I was given this book when I was a principal in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It, had tr it transformed the way I thought about leadership in schools. Trust in Schools by Anthony Bright. Powerful, powerful book. It's been around for at least 15 or 20 years. The other book is, called, uh, is entitled Primal Leadership by um, Daniel Goleman, and it's about styles of leadership. I was just talking to my students yesterday in class about the importance of knowing your style of leadership and being really confident with your style of leadership. He goes into emotional intelligence and the importance of really understanding styles of leadership. That's a great book. The next one is Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Between the World and Me. I believe every educator should read that book if you are educating children in this country. Period. New paragraph. It's about difference. It's about equity. It's about understanding the plight of certain communities, in this case, African American communities, particularly males. That is a powerful book. A book that I think is a great complement to that book is Hillbilly Elegy. If you read that book, raise your hand. How many of you read Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me? Oh, 
Okay, great, great to see. Hillbilly Elegy basically is, I think, a compliment to that book because it talks about the struggles of a certain other population in this country, rural white America, which is also a powerful struggle. I like to see those books together, powerfully um, read together, if you read them. Uh, and then this one is uh, on grading, and it's by Thomas Gusky. Uh, I, he just put out this book. One of the things, one of the ways that inequities get perpetuated in schools that is often hidden is through the way we grade students. And so Thomas Gusky goes into that in this particular book that just came out last year. And then this final book, um, Universal Design for Learning, is by a speaker that you will have um, shortly, Kate, um, Katie Novak, who's done amazing work. And I love this book because it gives very practical experience, practical examples of how to make all of this stuff that we're talking around, equity and access, um, multi-tier services and supports for kids. I love this book because it actually provides practical ways to do that. If you do not have the time to read, you do not have the time to lead. Just some of the books that we're looking at. Leading for students to success in three movements. I'm calling it in three movements because I'm a huge fan of the arts. I'm a huge fan of music. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I used to do, I taught English, which I loved, taught literature, advanced placement literature for many years, and I also directed a choir. As a matter of fact, before we leave, if we have time, we will try to sing together. Thank you, thank you. I got one applause, thank you very much. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, I'm, I'm serious about this, look at your neighbor real quick and say, you're going to sing, you're going to sing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have warned you I'm not your traditional speaker. Um, that is a picture of Gustavo Dudamel, the conductor of the LA Symphony, and he is with students um, in LA um, in their LA student orchestra. And I thought I would do it in three movements because I, I don't want us to ever forget the importance of the arts in the work that we do, no matter how we do it. MTSS, the arts are critical. They speak to a part of our students that other things don't necessarily speak to. That's why we're gonna do it in three movements. And let's go to the first one. Story, everyone say story. story. Say it like that gentleman just said, story. Say story. story. Beautiful. So one of the things that I want you to consider is what is the story that we're trying to tell with this work that we're doing around multi-tiered systems of support? And I wanna start that conversation by sharing with you a story, a personal story, around why I do the work that I do, and a story that I think is indicative of what you should be asking yourself about this work and about the work that you do on an individual basis. It's a personal story, true story. Some of you may have heard this, those of you have heard me. This is a story that's really important to me. Um, so I would say it has to be 35 years or so, 35, 36 years ago. My ninth grade English teacher, true story, Miss Scritchfield is her name, what's her name? Miss Scritchfield came to our class ninth grade, Central Junior High School, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And she said, class, we're going to be studying poetry. And in so many words, we're going to study the poet, Robert Frost. And we're going to study the poem, The Road Not Taken, by Robert Frost. And we're going to write about the poem. We're going to analyze the poem. And at the end of the unit, each student has the responsibility of getting up and reciting the poem for the entire class. That was, in essence, the assignment. 
And in ninth grade at that time, I was pretty, I, I wasn't the sort of refined young man that I am today. Um, and I pushed back on that assignment to Miss Scritchfield. I was like, Miss Scritchfield, I don't mind writing about the poem, mind analyzing the poem, but I don't want to get up and recite the poem for the entire class. And Miss Scritchfield, in so many words, said, Irvin, ninth grade, imagine me, Irvin, ninth grade. Not only are you going to recite the poem and write your own, recite your poem and analyze a poem, but I want you to write your own poem and recite that for the entire class also. So do the poem that everyone else has to do, which was The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Raise your hand if you're familiar with that poem. Oh, that's pretty much the whole room. Obviously, he should be, because he was born in Massachusetts, wrote a lot of his poetry and writing in Massachusetts. She said, now you're going to do The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost, but you're going to write your own poem and recite that for the, the entire class also. 30 seconds, turn to your neighbor real quick, answer this question. What do you think of Ms. what Miss Scritchfield just did with Irvin Scott? 30 seconds, that's all. Real quick, what do you think? What do you think? You've got to have an opinion. Talk real quick, 30 seconds. You're not going to just listen to me for an hour. Fifteen seconds. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to do a quick survey. There are three potential ways that you can respond. I'm only giving you three. There, isn't, there are more than three. The first one is, loved it, loved it. You go, Miss Scritchfield. The second one is, hmm, not sure. The third one is, not having it. Don't think she should have done it. All right, let's start with the third one. Third one, raise your hand. Look around the room, look, 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 look. Thank you. Second one. Look, 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 look. Look around the room. Third one. First one, first one, thank you. First one, raise your hand. Wow. Okay, that tells you something, right? Tells you something about our perspective of challenge and push. Well, the day came. I can talk about which one it was. The day came where I had to do it where she said, recite the poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost, after it, doing the analysis and writing and so forth and so on. And also do your own poem. And I stood up, ninth grade. And I said, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubt if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you very much. Here's the phenomenal thing about just sharing that. I love sharing that poem and that scene with educators. 
Because you do what educators do, teachers, former teachers and principals, you, and t you, you sit there on the edge of your seat. Some of you were actually reciting the poem. I saw your lips moving, I saw this gentleman's lips moving because you knew the poem, you were reciting it with me. Others of you sat up on the edge of your seat, you looked, you were smiling, and at the end of the poem, you clapped, you applauded. Why? Because you were celebrating the fact that I had done, I had made, met the challenge. Educators just do that. You just applaud at the end like, he did it. That was the challenge. He met the challenge. Some of you didn't applaud because you're thinking, she gave you another assignment also. <laughs> and you were holding back your applause. Well, I did that assignment also. But the thing about it is she allowed me access. She gave me an opportunity to access that assignment however I wanted to ex access it because she said, Irvin, you can write about anything you want to write about. 30 seconds again, quote, quick, turn to your neighbor, answer this question. What do you think he wrote his poem about? 30 seconds, go ahead, real quick, ninth grade. Don't forget where I was, ninth grade. <laughs> what do you think, what do you think? Four, three, two, one, zero. I'm not gonna run to you with a mic, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give her a general vicinity. I'm gonna say, over here, someone just tell me, what do you think I wrote about? Over here. Yes. A girl. A girl. <laughs> okay, uh, anyone in this general vicinity, just raise your hand real quick, I wanna hear one something. Yes. <laughs> you wrote it. He's basically saying, I think you wrote about Miss Critchfield. Okay. And then in this general vicinity, someone raise your hand. Let me hear you really, real quick, real quick. I said, real quick, y'all. <laughs> yes. Not wanting to write a poem. Here's what I wrote about. Thank you for those answers. Thank you for your, that reflection. I wrote this. Behind two backs I stand. Let's see if you can figure it out as I'm saying it. Waiting for the first back's hand, which holds the thing that makes me spring to reach the touchdowns brand. I wrote about football. Because at the time, that was the most important thing to me. The thing that I wanted to be was the next Tony Dorsett running back for the what, for who, who, anyone else? Dallas Cowboys, I know I'm in Patriots country, forgive me, please. <laughs> Running back for the Dallas Cowboys, number 33, won the Heisman Trophy, went to University of Pittsburgh. Was a running back, she said, write about anything. I said, behind two backs I stand, ninth grade, behind two backs I stand, waiting for the first back's hand, which holds the thing that makes me spring to reach the touchdown's brand. Sometimes I'm hit, which brings great pain, but it's even worse when my run's in vain, because some lineman jumps off sides and the ref yells out that it cost you five. But through all this, I must keep running so the defense will think he's quite stunning. People like that line for some reason. <laughs> He's quite stunning. They'll key on me from that play on, but I'm determined to keep on going. End of the poem. <laughs> Don't applaud me. Applaud Miss Scritchfield. I wish she were here. She and I still follow each other on Facebook. <laughs> Why? Okay, turn to your neighbor real quick. No matter where you were, loved it, not sure, or bad, pull out some of the teaching moves that she used real quick. Turn to your neighbor, what are the, any of the teaching moves that she used to make that happen? Turn, real quick, real quick, 30 seconds.
Someone let me know what time I have until, because I, I can't remember. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. So I'd love to hear, and usually when I do um, these, this particular presentations like this or talk about that story, I hear some of those teaching moves. Um, but if you said something, if one of them was high expectations, I think that was tremendously important. I think one of, the, one of the words that I love to use around this is academic press. Push, everybody say push. push. Academic press and push. I, I, there's another term that I use in education that I think we should be using a lot more of, and I think it's embedded in the work that you're trying to do, is warm demander. If you have a piece of paper, write that word down. There's literature on what a warm demander is, and Miss Scritchfield, in many ways, was a warm demander, right? I didn't think I could, she thought I could. Not only did she think I could do that, she thought I could do much more than that. She saw something in me that I didn't even see in me. And so much of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is enable students to see in themselves something that no one else sees in them, including themselves. But I would also say that that's true about teachers and leading teachers and leading adults. Tremendously important. You say, okay, so why are you talking about story? I start with story because I think it's important when you do this work, particularly when you lead this work, when you lead work that could become just another jargon, nesc term that we use in education, when you lead this work could just become another sort of another project or another initiative that we're trying to move forward in the system, I think it's tremendously important to capture the story of what we're trying to accomplish. And that story is both in a collective story that story is an individual story. As a matter of fact, I do, I do some research, we'll come back to this, on story. And there's a piece that I gave you um, by John Denny that I want you, when you get a chance, called uh, Telling Tales, I want you to read because it talks about the importance of story and leadership. And here are several of the things that um, not only he talks about also, but uh, Marshall Gantz talks about why it's important to get the story right when you're leading an initiative like this. One is, stories are fundamentally human. People, may under, people will get that MTSS is tremendously important, but they will also get, if you're able to attach the right story to MTSS, why it's important for individual students and schools. Stories build connections, which are critical for leaders. Stories bring data alive. I'm a huge fan of data, huge fan of data. One of the things that I learned when I was at the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation is that leaders often talk about the work that we do with numbers. Teachers and parents want to hear names. Numbers are tremendously important, but the question is how do you couple numbers with names? with individuals that bring that data alive. Stories have a way of doing that. And then stories capture what's possible. Here's what I want you to do for just a second. I'm gonna give you, uh, um, I'm gonna give you about 60 seconds on a piece of paper somewhere. Everybody needs something to write on. If someone were to ask you why your system is moving forward on MTSS, what's one component of the story that you would want to tell about why you're moving forward? If someone were to ask you individually, not you collectively, not everyone at your school district table, someone were to ask you individually, why are we moving forward? Why is this tremendous, why is this important for our system? What is a component of the story that you want to be able to tell? Just write that down. You just, I'm going to give you like 60 seconds. What's co one component of the story that you want to be able to tell collectively? Do that. 60 seconds.
10, 20 years. What's one component of the story? It might involve a person, it might involve an approach. Just about 60 seconds, good job, thank you for this. What's the story we're trying to tell, you believe? What is that story? Who's a part of that story? I see people still writing. I'll give you about 60 more seconds. Great job. 30 seconds. Okay, excellent. I'll give you one last assignment for another s about 60 seconds. If someone were to ask you individually why you do this work, why you are in the business of educating children, whether it's a, a, in, under the context of MTSS, whether it's some other program, why you do what you do, I want you to take 60 seconds and just jot down What's a component of the story that you tell to answer that question? Why you, not why you as a system, but why you individually do what you do. What's a component of that story? 60 seconds, real quick, go ahead. We can have all the technical stuff down and miss the opportunity to connect with people around what's important to them and what's important to us. I don't want us to go in this initiative that way. What's the story we're trying to tell? Excellent, 30 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, turn to your neighbor, just pick one person, just one person, don't share as a table, share as an individual, because we won't be able to get through the whole table. Share what you just said about both the system and what are we trying to do collectively and your individual. Go ahead, real quick, I'm gonna give you two minutes to do that. Just share, real quick. What's the story? One more minute.
Thank you, God. Thirty seconds. Hate to cut you off. Thirty seconds. So one of the powerful things about you being here together as a system with leaders in the system is it gives you an opportunity to get the message right, to get on one page around what we're trying to do. I've been a system level leader and I know the challenge in moving something forward in a system it becomes even more challenging if we have different visions of what we're trying to do. Look at your neighbor and say, let's get our story right. Let's get our story right. All right? So one of the things that I would encourage you to do is spend some time talking about messaging, talking about the story we're trying to tell, both individually and collectively. The second movement, leadership. Everybody say leadership. Leadership. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about leadership moves. So I've been blessed to have had the opportunity to lead in this great state um, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, so I was a principal in Pennsylvania. I was a teacher, started, started my teaching and principalship in Pennsylvania. Um, then was blessed to come here um, and lead in Boston. Um, highlight of, one of the highlights of my career. And one of the things that we were trying to do was move a multi-tiered system of supports during my time there. It's a high school, I was a high school academic superintendent, so oversaw the high schools, and then was a chief academic officer um, under Carol Johnson, a mentor, friend, colleague, and just tremendously blessed to have that opportunity. And so when I was asked to do this, I'm not sure if people knew that I had done that work or not, but one of the things that I thought I'd do is just talk about some of the leadership moves that we tried to make in moving that work forward. Um, give you some context real quick here on the slide. This is 2010, Boston Public Schools, after being the high school academic superintendent, overseeing the high schools in Boston. Multiple strategies, high level of autonomy in schools. So one of the things that was happening and probably happens in your context is that schools have a vision of how to do this work also. And so from a central office perspective, one of the questions be becomes, how do you bridge the gap between the school vision and the system's vision for getting this work done? Boston was, was then, and probably still is, uh, a philosophy of ha giving schools a lot of autonomy, which I'm a fan of, right? And so one of the challenges of that, of course, is then when you want to lead something from a system level, how do you ensure that we're all on the same page? Another part of that context was there were multiple strategies happening at the local, state, and national context, right? And so that's sort of the context that we were coming into as chief academic officer trying to lead this work. And so the question becomes, what are some of the leadership moves that we found to be tremendously important or beneficial as we sought to lead that work? going forward, and hopefully helpful to you. I say leadership moves and messages, because part of this is not just about the actions, part of it is also about what you say, and how you message, and how you communicate. One was, we were searching for system-wide coherence. Everybody say coherence. coherence. So there was a lot going on, how in the world do you find ways to tie those things together with the work that you're trying to move forward? So we were looking for system-wide coherence. 
The, the second was leveraging existing constructs. So one of the things I would encourage you to do as you're trying to move this work forward is look at what's happening already and figure out how to connect what's happening already if it's working. Not assuming that everything that you move forward has to be brand new. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we tried to do was leverage some of the existing constructs and meetings that we were having. PELP stands for Public Education Leadership Program, which, was, which is held at Harvard. And one of the things that we said was we're going to leverage that PELP structure to move this, for, this work forward rather than ex creating a brand new structure. So leverage what's existing. Third, ensure a cross-departmental focus. Like I'm hoping in this room there are individuals who represent different departments within the system, whether it's curriculum and instruction, whether it's ELL, whether it's uh, uh, special, special needs, students with disability department, whatever you call those departments, we had to find a way to connect multiple departments to this body of work if it was going to work well. But I would go for, further than just say academic departments, but operational departments were also tremendously important. Human resources was really important as we thought about human capital and the people that we needed to bring into the system who were going to move this work forward in powerful ways. So cross-departmental focus was tremendously important. And collaborating across departments was tremendously important. That's one of the reasons why I was so excited that one of the things that you encouraged in this meeting was to have the superintendent here. Tremendously important. Because if people don't feel like this is championed by the leader, they will question whether it's championed at all. And one of the things that we had during that time was a superintendent, when I was there, who was really pushing this moving forward. So I really applaud the fact that you've got uh, those leaders in the room. And then engage principals and teachers at a deep level early. Not once we built the structure, but while we were building the structure. Because ultimately, they were the ones who had to implement it. They were the ones who were moving it forward on a school-by-school on school level, classroom-by-classroom classroom level. Tremendously important to engage principals and teachers from the start. As a matter of fact, let me put you on the spot. Raise your hand if you're a principal in the room. Awesome. Thank you. Raise your hand if you're a teacher in the room. OK, so we need more teachers to be at the grassroots of building this work and leading this work going forward. Teacher leadership, tremendously, tremendously important. Instructional leadership teams that include principals, that include teachers, that include department heads. Ultimately, they're the ones who are doing the work on the ground. They have to be engaged. Um, early. And then a phased approach versus all at once. This is one of the things that we, we were challenged with it when we were moving forward in Boston. We debated whether we should roll it out and say everyone's doing it at the same time, whatever that it was, or whether we were going to do it several schools at a time, pilot it. What we ended up doing was several schools at a time. We thought it was important to have sort of depth rather than breadth. Make sure that they understand it at the core of the work. Make sure the teachers were invested in it. Make sure the principals were invested in it at the core of the work. And then at the same time, the phased approach allowed us to learn something we don't always do at a system level well. We implement and we go to something else. Implement to go to something else. But if the phased, approach, the phased approach allowed us to see the mistakes, learn from the mistakes, and then we rolled out another phased approach with another set of schools over time, and we could correct some of those mistakes. Okay, 30 seconds. Turn to your neighbor, 
some of your takeaways, reactions to what you just saw up there. Just turn, real quick. Reactions, could be positive, could be negative, could be questions, whatever. Something we should consider, something we, we're doing, something we're not doing, something we should be more thoughtful about. Go ahead, 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Five, four, three, Two, one, zero. It's funny, Rebecca showed you a visual because we worked on, we worked to create a visual when we were doing this work. This, this goes back, I think, at least 10, 9, 10 years ago. And it, it wasn't perfect. It's, it, there, there, are many, there were many challenges to it. So I don't want to talk about it as though it were perfect. There's a lot of challenges to it. But this is the visual that we ended up coming up with. And so if you look at that visual, you'll notice three major components to it. One was, of course, RTI, sort of the academic um, vision of what tiered support looked like. One was social, emotional, and behavioral. So we, we said that those, we have to stop thinking about those separately. They have to be together. And because of the context of Boston with ELL students, we had to also think about ELL. We had to. And we didn't want students, we didn't want the system to think about services outside of the needs of those particular students. Right? And so I won't go into that, but that's what we ended up coming up with. And we referred to it as the academic achievement framework. At that time, Context is tremendously important. There was the rollout of the Common Core state standards was happening, and so there was a huge focus on new standards that were happening in the country. There wasn't as much as focus on social and emotional behavior as there is today, right? And appropriately, it should, there should be. But also, we were also being looked at by Office of Civil Rights about our ELL populations and not serving them adequately, which Boston has done a tremendous, amazing job of improving that over the years. But that's what our tiered services looked like. And that became the frame for moving this work forward, understanding what, was, what we were going to expect for all students at tier one, and then moving on up, right? So I just wanted to give you a visual of that. Uh, it says circa 2010. And then, to me, um, naming it something that wasn't just around tiered services, but was around the ultimate goal we were trying to accomplish, which was achievement, was tremendously important. Movement three in the final movement. Everyone say equity. If equity is not found in your work, I'm not sure why you're doing it. We just put it that way. Rebecca talked a little bit about data. I want to give you an opportunity to look at some data. And I want you to question this data. I was standing in the back when I was getting my tea and I thought, I don't know if they're going to be able to see this, but I hope you're able to see it in the back. What I'm getting ready to show you, everyone, are two data points from a school district that I was working with in North Carolina. And they basically, the school district, the superintendent and I, good friends, she asked me to come in and sort of lead the academic overhaul of her system. She was coming in as a new superintendent and she said, would you lead the academic um, sort of uh, revisioning 
of the system and then present it to me in the school system. And they gave me a ton of data, me with a principals and teachers, like 20 of us. And we had like three or four months. And so they gave us a ton of data and we were just going through the data to try to understand how the schools were doing. I, there were a lot of schools, 100, at least 100 schools. And then we did school visits, we went into classrooms. While I was looking at some of the data, I came across this slide that I'm getting ready to show you. I'm getting ready to show you reading and math in this school system. And there is a acronym that you will see on there that says ECONOP, that's EDS, which stands for Economically Disadvantaged Students. And then there are non-EDS, non-economically disadvantaged students. I'm going to give you a minute to look at both slides, maybe 90 seconds to look at both slides, and tell me what you see. Jot down what you see. All right? Everyone understand? Here we go. Here's the first slide. This is reading proficiency for the school system. Not economically disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged by race. Asian, black, Hispanic, white, other. This is reading for the entire system. 30 seconds, just look at it. What do you see? Don't talk about it, just look at it. This is reading. Okay, 15 seconds, 15 more seconds, we're gonna to go to math. Four, three, two, one, zero. Math. This is math. Thirty seconds, turn to your neighbor, what do you see? I'm going back to reading. What do you see? What 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 do you see? Fifteen seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, one of the things that I hope you saw was this. This is reading. And economically disadvantaged white students are outperforming black and Latino students who are not economically disadvantaged. So it's better, this is going to sound pretty blunt, it's better be, to be poor and white in this school district than it is to be black or Latino, middle class, upper class. Now that's going up the ladder pretty quickly. But when I saw this slide, I went to the superintendent and I was like, you, got, you, got, you have an equity issue in this district big time. It's also the case in math. And the reason, reason why I love data so much is it uncovers stuff like this that people don't talk about. But this, you can't hide. This, you can't hide. And this is our responsibility to do something about. Whether it's about race, whether it's about gender, whether it's about language, somebody doesn't get served. And the question is, what are we doing about it? And in the heart of this work, we have to be answering asking and answering that question fundamentally 
and exposing the reality of it. Let me put it a different way. Back to story. This is elevator story. This is my elevator story. True story. My son, um, one day my wife, Keisha, I have three sons, Irvin, Leon, and Nicholas. Irvin's a teacher. Um, Leon's still in school. Nicholas is playing football and um, for, the, for the NFL. Um, and one day, my wife called me. This is when Irvin was in college. My wife called me and she was like, sweetie, oh, that's what she calls me. <laughs> She's like, sweetie, um, you've taken, this is when I was working for the Gates Foundation, you've taken Leon and Nicholas to Seattle with you when you've gone out there to work, but you've never taken Irvin with you because Irvin was in college. He'd gone to college just down the street, Holy Cross at the time. And so he, I was like, sweetie, he's in college. He's, been, he's playing football there. And he's, she's like, God, he will you and he will regret him not ever going out there if you stop working for the Gates Foundation. You never took him to Seattle. I was like, you're so, you're, you're so smart. Um, brilliant. And so I called Irvin. I was like, Irvin, your mother said, um, <laughs> Your mother said that you should come to Seattle with me and, and we should chill some time out there because you've never gone. He's like, okay, Dad, I'll I find, some, found, find some time and we'll go out there. Long story short, we go out to Seattle. I work during the day. Irvin chills during the day. And then we go out at night. And so we went out one night having a good time. We come back to the hotel dressed, relaxed, and just chilling. Um, Sheraton right there on 4th street in Seattle. Um, and so we go to the hotel, and it's one of these hotels, these really nice hotels where they have multiple uh, elevator doors. And we go to the elevator door, Irvin and I, waiting for the elevator to open up. We're chilling and laughing it up. And the elevator opens up, and there are two men on the elevator. And they, one is getting ready to come off. You can see this all in a split second. One is getting ready to come off, basically say bye to the other one. And as he was saying bye, he looked up, he saw us, he saw Irvin and I, and he stepped back on the elevator and he said, I'll go up, I'll go up with you. And so Irvin and I get on the elevator. And we go up. We get to our floor and we get off the elevator. And we go to the room, our room. Irvin goes into the room, and he is livid. He's hot, like I have never seen him. It's my 22-year-old son. I've never seen him like this. I see him on the football field, hot, and, but that's football. He comes into the room, I kid you not, and he starts hitting stuff. I can't believe that. You see that? That's what he starts saying. Dad, you see that, right? I was like, Irvin. And he's just passionate. I try to calm him down. I realize he's not going to calm down. I, he's, he's, he's not going berserk, but he's hot. But then it occurs to me that one of them was coming down the elevator. And if I went to the elevator, and went down, I might run into him. So, <laughs> I leave the room, go to the elevator, and go down the elevator. And I kid you not, I wouldn't be telling this story if it weren't the truth. Coming out of the other elevator when I get down to the first floor, is the guy who went back up. Okay, I'll end the story right there. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. I go up to him. And I said, excuse me, uh, I just want you to know that um, what you just did wasn't cool. B 
Before I finished, he said, wait, 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 let me explain, let me explain. I, said, like, I was like, wait a minute. You, what I have upstairs right now is a 22-year-old son who is livid about just what happened. Nothing was ever said, but he felt it. He saw it. He experienced it. He's reacting to it. Now, I have shared this story, just pause for a second. I have shared this story in places where people in the audience, I could tell, didn't know what happened. And if that is the case in this room, I want to make sure you do know what happened. So, in 15 seconds, turn to your neighbor and make sure they understand why Irvin was livid. Real quick, 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We all know. In the middle of that story of me explaining to him what was going on, out of nowhere he said, um, can I have your cell phone number? And that threw me. I, I, that honestly threw me. But I'm who I am. I said, sure. 202-716-83, don't y'all write it down. <laughs> I said, gotcha. 202-716-8303. I gave it to him. He said, I'd like to, could I take, could I go out to dinner with you and your son tomorrow? I was like, sure. I went upstairs, I was like, Irvin? <laughs> We're going to dinner. <laughs> Guess who's coming to dinner? Just kidding. I said, we're going to dinner. Irvin's like, he paying? <laughs> we went to dinner the next night. The Purple Cafe, Seattle. And we talked. As a matter of fact, I did less talking with him than he and Irvin talked. And people ask me all the time, what did they talk about? I wasn't trying to be in that conversation. It was just my responsibility to ensure that it happened. People ask me all the time, why did you go back down the elevator? It was a reactionary thing for me. I had never seen my, I, ha, I, I felt implicit bias. I see it, I experience it, I had experienced it. Continue to experience it, but I had never seen my son experience it. That's why I went down the elevator. And so, as I close, what I want to remind you is there is something called in locus parentis, where we stand in place of the parent. And so the question for you, and the question that I leave you with, is are you going down the elevator for kids? Particularly inequities that relate to kids? Are you just letting them have what happens happen? We are in position to go down the elevator. Full stop. If we don't, there is no guarantee somebody will. Not in society, not in housing, not in the economy, not in jobs, but in school. When you see data like that, you got to go down the elevator. 
You gotta expose it. And if you don't, you will just have a lot of hot kids, but not kids whose lives are changed. Never forget what this work is about. This is not just another initiative. This is about transforming lives. And with that, I thank you. Oh, but I, oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I applaud you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.